It is September 17th, 2012. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. The reason uh, why you might be listening today is uh, to hear a candidate uh, interview with someone who's going to be a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, that's not a Republican or Democrat, an independent or a third party choice. And today we have Joseph uh, uh, Diafieria. He is uh, running for the uh, 16th District of New York. And uh, actually, maybe we can ask Joseph to uh, explain the 16th District a little bit and what got him motivated to be uh, on the ballot this year. And um, and actually, yeah, I'll just leave the intro at that. Joseph, it is great to talk with you today. Uh, oh, so thank, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for having me on. You're very welcome, and, and and so you're providing people a choice besides the Republicans or the Democrats, and um, running on the Green Party. And uh, please tell us a little bit about the 16th district, or what it will be like, um, you, you know, after 2012, and, and what got you motivated sure. to you know run in this uh, 2012 year. Sure. First of all, the 16th district is newly reconfigured, or re newly redistricted, I should say. It encompasses. Uh, Lower Westchester County and the northern third of Bronx County. Uh, essentially, if you're familiar with the area, everything between Interstate 287 and Gun Hill Road in the Bronx, uh, excluding the city of White Plains. Um, the incumbent, uh, I want to say theoretically, because there, there's really no incumbent because it's newly reconfigured, but the, the, the de facto incumbent is Elliot Engel. And uh, as far as why we've gotten involved in this, we, uh, well, personally, I have never, or I should say not for most of my adult life, have I discerned any serious difference between the Democrats and the Republicans that I've seen both parties as differing merely in tactics and not ideology. Both are um, supporters of the status quo, but it's just a matter of one party wanting to redesign and, and retool and reconfigure the policies of the other, but they're both committed to the same level of militarism and uh, widening of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. I mean, neither is seriously committed to health care or a, a, a comprehensive jobs program, as I have advocated. And, um, for example, also, I mean, let's, let's look back to the to the most recent Bush administration, the uh, the reprehensible Patriot Act enjoyed bipartisan support, as has the uh, National Defense Authorization Act of 2012, the, the Military Commissions Act before that. I mean, here are police state measures that have uh, that have sailed seamlessly seamlessly through Congress, irrespective of which party is in control. So all of these things taken together, I mean, it, it is just supported my position, my long-held position at that, that the, the major political parties, I, I prefer to call them the corporate political parties, that again, they, they do not, they do not differ fundamentally. Yeah, if we, if, if we I mean, the, anyone who thinks an empire is a good idea, I mean, I would say think again, I guess the, the only person who's going to do well in an empire is the emperor. Um, and uh, so, you know, what are some of the offshoots of an empire, like maybe the Patriot Act, the NDAA, a violation of our <coughs> rights, um, giving more of our sovereignty, of our privacy to the government, while the government just gains more and more privacy. They're the boss, um, you know, is carrying us around with a leash while we're the ones who should be in charge. Um, and we wouldn't treat, um, you know, our public servants that way, of course, but right. it's... Uh, it, Elliot Engel, yeah, okay, so yeah, he was in the 17th or last round. Now he's in the 17th. This um, he's in the 16th now, which is where we're running. But and he right. did vote for the NDAA. And, yes, he um, did. He sure did. He voted for um, indefinite the ability for the president to uh, carry out indefinite detention of the military to police our streets for people to be just snatched and grabbed and, and never heard of from ever again without having any due process habeas corpus knowing the chargers or accusers against them just to be like plucked up kind of like you know an alien abduction and um and, and and who knows where you know they could be sent to 
you know, some place that we've never heard of probably and, and, and tortured or, or whatever. Right, ostensibly Guantanamo Bay, but who knows, I mean, any place uh, in, in Alaska perhaps. And then, of course, there's the rendition policy where they could be sent to the, uh, you know, to any foreign country that is a U.S. ally and, you know, dealt with in whatever manner there. Yeah. Now, um, if I can just address one point that you made with regard to the government, I, uh, I would differentiate between the government and the, the elite class that the government serves. And th that is the purpose of any government, to, to set forth the program for the ruling class. Now, it, it is the elite that have, uh, th that have seen to it that these policies are, are initiated. And whenever a ruling class embarks upon any kind of endeavor, whether it's a global war, whether it's, uh, whether it's a regional war, wh whether and any, any departure from the status quo, any time that, it, that there's any expectation that such is not going to meet the approval of the masses, that is when we see policies brought forth, such as the Patriot Act and NDAA 2012, that are intended to dispense with our civil, li civil liberties and civil rights. Oh yeah. So I, would, I wouldn't be, characterize it as the government. Oh no, no, you're you're absolutely okay. right, and, and and that's it, and and by doing so, it, it's 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 I've been so, you know, beaten down with our media of, of these uh, frameworks and these narratives that uh, you know we are not our government. It's all, they. It's always they. You know they. they we're always looking out for someone else to lead us, and uh, you know we're not in control of our own future. It's always they, the government. They tax us. They do this. They right. do that. And and it's 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 whoever gets elected that gets to do that, and um, and that is something else. I mean, probably uh, if your district is similar to the rest of the nation, um, in the last couple of well, I I, I don't want to even say probably. It, who knows what the future holds? But in the past, I mean, about 50 percent of your uh, constituents have turned out. Whether it's the 16th, 17th district, have even turned out to to vote um the, you know i mean it's um, now this year we do have a 10 percent approval rating for congress there's a lot of disapprovement um i mean i, I pe people are occupying you, you know the streets there you know there's tea parties before that so, i mean this has been brewing for e even i would say since 1992 with ross perot sure. and it died down a little bit and then and, and then we had 9-11, so everyone had to, um, y you know, rally behind the leader, just like they do in any other country, even with someone you don't really like, um, and um, and probably even worse in, in some other countries. Sure. And, um, and, and so we've been really having, I, I mean, you know, getting ripped off, getting our rights taken away by, you know, the people that we've elected in charge, and, and we think that... Um, you know, the voting, not voting is like a demonstration, like somehow, you, you know, we can be above it. I, I guess, you, you know, I mean, if that's, you, you know, if you just want to sacrifice yourself away, uh, go ahead, be a sacrifice. But um, I don't think that's necessary. I think, um, you know, if we uh, plan on living with others, um, you, you know, we've set up a place where we can elect people from different districts to represent us and and there could be better ways to do it i mean sure, there could be sure. runoff elections there could be more checks and balances even besides just the three maybe we need a fourth branch to have oversight and and that really should be us i mean it could yes work. absolutely i think that people are really not aware of their own empowerment i think the the entertainment culture that we are really really has directed people's minds and hearts away from the political process and um, it, uh, what it what has happened it, it has been reduced really to a matter of just um, going out on election day and choosing between the Democrat and the Republican just as uh, one might sit and watch the Super Bowl once a year and then it's over and done with and I think politics itself is something that people may find themselves interested in or not interested in as they might find themselves interested in baseball or hockey or, or something else. It, it's, um, again, people don't understand or don't realize their own empowerment and uh, political life, I believe, has, come, has become really just an incidental part of American life. And what's, what's most alarming now is that what little um, political power we have, well, actually, we have much more power than we realize, but to the extent that any of it is really being applied, I mean, it's being dwindled and, and taken away. I mean, we, we're bearing all of the markings of a fascist, fascist social order. We have uh, 
the, 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 you know, the merger of corporation and yeah, state yeah. as Mussolini described exactly fascism. you know corp you know corp the, the, this interweaving of uh, corporate and state power you have religion and state power that are also increasingly interwoven you have rigged elections and let's be frank we we had a president for eight years George W Bush who served two terms despite losing to presidential elections so you know, all of it is moving ominously toward a uh, I hesitate to call it a Hitlerian social order but but, but here again, if, if people do not realize, if people don't come to terms with their own political empowerment and start start actually doing something that... Um, the, right, you, right. The people, I mean, the people that just tried to, you know, not vote as a protest in Nazi Germany, I mean, uh, it, it's, um, it, 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 you know, um, it didn't quite work out there. I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't work out, that we all couldn't just sit down and protest one day and, and have that kind of organization. I mean, that would be great. I think you could try to do both. I mean, why not try to do both? Instead of not voting, how about not voting for the Republican or the Democrat? Exactly, exactly, because uh, I, for a while, I... The sentence there, yeah. Yeah, vote. I mean, for a while, for I personally Democrat. had embraced the, the not voting, thinking that, that, it, you know, that it didn't matter and, and that really no serious change could be effectuated by voting and uh, that there was a, a slogan that I was once fond of and that is not a slogan, but an idea, I suppose, a concept that if voting were, if voting could change anything, it would be illegal. But, but then again, why, why not? I mean, it, it, I suppose going out and running as, as a green, there, here we're bringing new issues to the table. I mean, pardon the, pardon the cliche, but we're we're introducing new ideas. What we're what we're trying to do is really familiarize people not only with different issues different issues but with their own political empowerment and I th I think that in, in, in hindsight uh, I, w I was mistaken in my belief that that simply not voting voting was a was a serious and legitimate way of protesting I, I think that's what the parties don't want you to do is to vote they want a low turnout so their right. base can turn out and, and win the election by 30 percent that's what they want they wouldn't care if there's a 1% turnout, they don't have any shame to be shamed with. Um, that's why I keep trying to say they don't have any shame. Some people can't imagine people without any shame, but they do exist. And, um, and, and I mean, they, look at the laws they're passing. The NDA, they're, 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 they're either uh, incompetent or they're just um, uh, in contempt. And I would say that kind of incompetency is contempt, um, even if it is. Um, but, uh, like, when you see a Democrat or Republican on the ballot this year, I mean, I just want you to think, like, um, you, you know, is that your only choices? I mean, is this what uh, has been working for you for, you, you know, is there, can you conceive of anything better? Can you see, like, you know, if you don't think it's going to make a difference, I mean, we do have a balance of power. We, we have won a lot of court cases, actually, um, over the the last 12 years, I mean, striking down some of the things Bush has done right now, um, some journalists are uh, co uh, contending the um, NDAA law through the courts. Um, uh, Chris Hedges, one of the journalists, a couple other journalists. That's like, right, yeah. Chomsky was part of the lawsuits and, and one other uh, person, and um, and they're winning, and the judge is upholding that. There are, like, still people in our government. It's not completely... Um, you know, bots and, and, and sold out completely. I mean, it's getting there. And uh, and there are people that have stood up. There are people in government that have gotten fired. There oh, are indeed there have. I mean, you, you, know, you know, there are fortunately a fair number of uh, Dennis Kucinich's and and Cynthia McKinney's. But of course, look, look what has happened to people who, who have exercised some conscience um, and bo both lost their uh, congressional seats we know of course we all know what happened to paul wellstone maybe we don't want to get into that but uh <laughs> i don't think it's too much to speculate that well I've, I've thought about that yeah i don't know any of the facts on that but uh, but but that is strange and um yeah i mean there's um i mean and, and uh I mean, so Dennis Kucinich is not going to be there next year. Uh, right. Ron Paul is not going to be there next year. Um, there still will be Bernie Sanders. And um, yes. yeah. you could even argue on, on a lot of civil libertarian ar arguments on um, Rand Paul. And uh, and then, um, you, you know, there might be one or two other people in the House that, um, 
you know, you might not have heard of too much that, that might try to step it up a little bit, but... Yeah, I would uh, say that Jose Serrano of the Bronx is one of the, you know, one of the few bright lights on Capitol Hill also. Yeah, um, I, it, so, I mean, but there, imagine if there was 50, imagine here's the list of demands for the Occupy Wall Street for the Tea Party is to get, it's not a list of demands, it's just a personal goal for yourselves, not to demand from anyone else. Um, it's just to get 50 plus people that are not Republican or non Democrat elected to the House this 2012, a November to remember. And, um, and, and, and basically, t t uh, this process, I mean, it's just going to start, that will open up the cracks to let the light in. That will, if that happens, there will be a lot more whistleblowers. If that happens, the Republicans and the Democrats are going to start tripping on their own feet. They're start going to getting desperate. They're going to act desperate. They're going to say stuff that they never intended to say. They're going to do a lot of stupid mistakes if that happens. They're going to feel the pressure. And, and in 2014, hopefully, we'll get even more. That's just going right. to break Right. Now, what I, what I would caution, however, and I, I, I absolutely agree, but with every with every new democratizing force or with with every with every shift in power with it with every little onslaught of awareness that that is allowed to be countered with more state power so we have to be we, yes we have to introduce new information we have to get different kinds of ideas out to the people we know we have to educate the the masses too as to what is really going on as far as state power and that and that such things as the Patriot Act are really not new phenomena. We can go back e even to Rex 84, but um, but we have to be on our guard because the you know the when you have massive amounts of power concentrated, well, that is to say, wealth and power concentrated in the hands of very few people, the greatest threat to that power is an informed and educated public. We live in a society that is, that is essentially governed by really a handful of billionaires, and there are 307 million of us, and they realize this. Oh, knowledge so, is power, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the greatest threat to the established order is an informed electorate. So with every, with every what is the term that I'm looking for, for, for every little bit of information that reaches mass audiences, for, for every... For every new, uh, again, to use the term, you know, democratizing political force that emerges, it is liable to be met with additional state power. And uh, I believe that that is the reason why we're, we're seeing such legislation now as the National Defense Authorization Act, that it is due at least in part to the genesis of the, um, the Occupy movement. Well, this is an idea that has no organization. This is just an idea of getting as many independent third-party candidates elected to the Congress, mm -hmm. where there's less of a um, of uh, politics, like most people, I think, might be able to, you know, stomach um, that. No matter how you feel about, uh, about Obama, Romney, I mean, let's not even get into those kind of, um, you know, distracting debates. Let's focus on the exactly, House. Exactly, exactly. Because again, they, they're only going to different tactics. They, they're going to be talking about basically what what I call the boilerplate stuff. You know, we're gonna reducing taxes on the middle class, and you know. You know, we're going to tweak health care just a little bit, but in no event does either candidate, does either party really stand for a significant redistributive change. Uh, they, they both stand for empire versus exactly. republic. And, um, and, and so we're talking about getting the republic back. I mean, it's just, think, you know, the re it's been an age-long thing. I mean, this was talked about thousands of years ago, republic or um, a, a democratically elected republic with a balance of power and uh, checks, balances, branch of the government that's accountable to the people uh, with the constitution and um, or a uh, or an empire and an and, and empire really it just breeds unto itself even though it it, it, it affects other countries overseas that they're conquering or democratizing or however they want to say it. Uh, they claim they're, they're you, you know, spreading civilization. Um, yeah, when really no no that, one country can bring civilization to another. And, um, and it, it's never, it has never been superior culture or superior civilization that has allowed one to dominate the other. It, it has invariably been superior firepower. That, that have enabled empires to do that. Yeah, and whatever an empire's ever done, you know, how, you know, the type of firepower it does use against other countries, um, uh, the the slaughters, um, 
the mass murders, um, et cetera, to, for over resources. Um, it always comes back to the people because in order to be an empire, it almost goes hand in hand. Um, like you, you, there's not, I don't think there's ever been an empire where the, um, the, the homeland kept all their freedoms and constitutional rights. Um, it's always evolved into a militaristic uh, uh, society at home as well. Exactly, because people, decent people like us, I mean, we are not innately militaristic. And when the propaganda machine fails to you know, to inculcate people with these notions of an external threat, then, of course, m much more decisive means have to be taken against ordinary people. But, you know, people, people want peace most of the time, which for those who are bent on waging war, that, that is something that is, of course, seriously problematic. So when the, when the wheels of uh, propaganda, so to speak, begin to get rusty, when there's no longer um, an effective legitimation that can be proper to the masses, then the, the state, the empire, has to take much more conclusive means as far as you know, first shepherding and then, of course, forcing the masses of people to go along. And that, that's where we're at now. That's why we have the Patriot Act and all these other things. You, know, you also had Executive Directive 51 under Bush, and just to name several. And um, if I, can, you know, I mentioned Rex 84 briefly a few minutes ago. That was something that was engendered during the Reagan administration. That was um, if, if the invasion of Nicaragua had gone forward as, as had been planned, it would have been, first of all, illegal under every conceivable interna international canon. But it, all, but it would have been every bit as unpopular with the American people. So the idea behind Rex 84, although it was ostensibly billed as something, you know, you know, immigration control or some such thing, I mean, the, the usual the usual ra rationales that are proffered now nowadays, but that would have involved, would have entailed the mass incarceration of peace activists. Now, fortunately, this was something that was exposed during the Iran-Contra hearings. It was uh, Jack Brooks, the congressman from Texas, taking his legislative duties very seriously. He brought this out before the public. I, I remember the hearings themselves. Ali North practically dropped his jaw. Now, of course, he was told not to pursue that question. It was Sen Senator Daniel Inouye, the senator from Hawaii, who was still in office, actually, who, who ordered Congressman Brooks to desist. But at that point, it was too late. Oh, you're talking about um, the continuity of government? Uh, well, they, yeah, well they, they, yeah, it's all... Yeah, no, I, I've heard about that. Like, it, yeah. what hap like they, there's already... Um, I, I mean, to me, the, 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 the common sense thing to do, like, it, if you know, God forbid, like, you, you know, the White House and the Congress was destroyed. I mean, it, it, by some kind of attack from another country, how would, what would be the continuity of government? I mean, number one, I mean, that should be made public and that should be voted on. But, but number two, I mean, it, it, it seems like common sense would be, I mean, we have a chain of like, we already have a continuity of government. I mean, it, after the vice president, I think it goes to the, uh, the, the Speaker of the House. The and Speaker then of the House the and then the uh, President pro tempore of the Senate. So, yeah, there, there is there is a protocol for presidential There's succession. And then the House, I, I mean, the states would um, get new representatives. They would, like, have immediate, um, they would maybe even have some, you know, send someone from their own house to, to, to temporarily like um, be that representative until there is elections. I mean, there's um, so many um, common sense things that, you, you know, we would be able to get back on footing really quickly um, instead of like some kind of military grab. Um. Exactly. So that's why there, there you no know, such information as uh, Mount Weather in Virginia. That was C-SPAN. Yeah. 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 Like, so we, I mean, we, how can we make a fully informed decision? How can anyone, why would anyone, like, vote for someone who's going to keep them in the dark like the Republicans and the Democrats? Exactly, I mean, exactly. So, I mean, that that's that that's part of what has to reach the masses, too. The whole, the, the, the whole concept, I mean, they, 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 they'll talk a great deal about... Uh, public oversight and transparency, but we have to look at that seriously. I mean, for, I mean, how many Americans have heard of Mount Weather under Virginia? I mean, how many have even heard of Rex 84, the Military Commissions Act, or uh, wh whatever might be going on? I mean, you're the solution. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't even need to be here. If everyone just got the idea that, um, you know, select the other 
option, like quit picking the same yeah. thing. I, I mean, just pick the other person, like get to know them a little bit, make sure they're going to take their oath to the Constitution seriously. But beyond that, if they have character, they're not going to sell out. They're, you know, they've had a real job and they've, um, you, you know, take these positions seriously and have a spine and are willing to, uh, you know, protect and defend the Constitution. And uh, then, you know, that's better than the person who's um, just going to off you know promise everything but not going to give you anything and um it, it, compared to someone who's really going to try and, and fight the um special interests who are um you know fighting us uh, right now they're stealing our money and they're taking away our rights they're taking away you know what has made america america yeah yes and it is it is most certainly our money we're and and 1.3 trillion dollars of our money have been spent waging wars of imperial brigandage in the Middle East and South Asia. Yeah, and uh, I mean, even, I mean, uh, there's black budgets and there's, I mean, uh, sure. accountability, there, we need auditing of the, I mean, we don't even, there could be trillions more that a lot of people speculate too, and then we spend a lot of money in South America, we spent a lot over the decades on the drug war, not mentioning to mention like how much you know cost to prosecute people what the cost is on families that don't have like you know a father or a mother that's uh to raise them and um and 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 so on and so on and, and just all the um you know there should be a um a drug war memorial of all the victims from the drug war yes. um and yes. uh that would list like uh, you know hundreds of thousands millions of names actually as we and have of course where are the drugs coming from i mean the very government that is telling us or telling our children to say no to drugs is itself the biggest drug trafficker in the world. Now, th this is not speculation. They're the same people who don't want us to vote. So. Yeah, yeah, it, this is not conspiracy theory. I mean, it, it's, it's a matter of congressional record that the CIA and the DIA have for decades involved themselves in the trafficking of heroin and cocaine. In fact, that way they can have a black budget so they don't have to be accountable to the Congress because right, they have the a black Constitution requires everything um, is accountable. Every single penny spent should be accountable. Yeah, they have a black budget, but this also, they have a way of shepherding the raw materials into, into the prison industrial complex, which, and of course, the prison industry is a, a booming billion dollar industry. So as long as there are drugs entering the inner, city, inner cities and then people of color being systematically targeted, Targeted, they there thereby have the raw materials, namely human beings, to shepherd into this prison system to make still more money. Yeah, it's it's a revolving door. It's unsustainable. Yeah. It's going to eat itself um, until it's uh, there's nothing left. Um, and uh, and it has its 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 appetite is growing, folks. Um, uh, so it's time to you, you know put this uh, monster on a diet and uh, on a fast actually and it's and we better do it fast um, and, and it's time for us to you know have this appetite for liberty and it can happen really quickly the the, the the year they don't expect it is now they, they don't expect us to all of a sudden just wake up now um, 2012 would be a perfect year because it's not expected and and and, and if we get like up to 50 people elected um, I mean there's hundreds of people running i just and you know some elections could be rigged but what i'm saying is like if if we try to get like 535 maybe we could get 50 through and um and and, and that would be a huge thing i mean that that would put them on the defensive and um and, and it would be up to us to you know try to get more in 2014 but what tell us a little bit about um well you did kind of tell us about your district actually um but um uh, what what are some of your um uh, you know, favorite people, um, and um, and actually, uh, well, I did re about your district. What also is your appeal to like? Because I don't think there's like a libertarian or anyone running in your district, is there? Or you're just the only? Um, Not that I know of. I believe there is a libertarian candidate running for. Um U.S. Senate. There is, of course, Coley. Right, but I just mean in your district. Oh no, no, no. But for U.S. Senate, I just want, just uh, as a matter of record, I am supporting Colia Clark, okay. our uh, Green, you know, the Green Party's nominee for U.S. Senate. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, there's plenty of districts where there is only a Libertarian or only a Green Party candidates, and um, those districts should be a slam dunk. Uh, I mean, 
decision. It, it should be like if you're libertarian, I mean, you should appeal just as much to them. They might not agree with all your issues. Um, disgruntled Republicans, disgruntled Democrats. Right, sure. If they agree on the war, if they agree on the um, drug war, if they agree on our civil liberties or, you know, our Bill of Rights that's um, endangered right now, if they agree on, crony, you know, outing crony capitalists. Yes, um, yes. I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm, that, that's true. I, I'm sure that the that political progressives. I mean, those are huge issues. Yeah. I mean, those can overlook a lot of, you know, flaws. I, I mean, I, I mean, what they would consider flaws, I don't necessarily. I'm just saying that should outweigh anything, you, you know, of, of some of the other minor issues, I think. Right, absolutely, because w w what is happening now... Those I mean, are the ones you, we you, can you, actually get something to done together if we band together. So. Yeah, I mean, you've characterized it as crony capitalism, while others would simply characterize it as capitalism, and it's probably fair to say that left progressives on right, the one hand... and some people characterize Obama's yeah. Obamacare as socialism when it's really fascism, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, that that, that is really a, a, a cruel hoax, Obamacare, because what it is, essentially, it is a requirement that everyone obtain his and her own health care, so it, it is tantamount to solving homelessness by requiring everyone to buy a house. That's exactly what, what how Obama argued yeah. the argument in 2008 against Hillary Clinton when he got that loud applause like saying, you know, well, the difference between me and you, Hillary, is that I'm not going to force people to buy mandated insurance because, yeah, it'd be like telling a poor person exactly what you said. Right. Now, I, I and I don't want to, when, I, I don't want to, to appear as though I'm endorsing uh, Hillary and Bill Clinton's health care plan of yesteryear. But what is interesting is that um, when the Clintons tried to tinker with health care just a little bit, what happened? On came Monica Lewinsky, a national nightmare, a, a, a presidential impeachment, all that sort of thing. They, they, they might have been a little hard time, but actually even Reagan before them, a lot of people don't know this, was um, in the deals working with Congress to pass a, uh, right. a, 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 a public option. And actually, it was Double ARP that um, used their lobbying money to, to shut it down. And actually, Carter was going to offer the same thing. Even Nixon, I think, was thinking yeah. about it. And so. the, well, uh, yeah, I mean, many, <laughs> strangely enough, and, and again, I, I don't want to sound as though I'm defending Richard Nixon, far from it, but he, he had antagonized many of the very same corporate interests that John F. Kennedy had. But of course, in Richard Nixon's case, his demise had to be carried out much more antiseptically than John F. Kennedy's was. So, I mean, what they did was first they removed Spiro Agnew, and then finally they took Nixon down in August of 84. But, but just back to the case of the Clintons, I mean, their, their attempt to address health care in, uh, in whatever perfunctory manner they had sought to do so, that was met with a, you know, the, the national nightmare of, of Monica Lewinsky and then, of course, Bill Clinton being impe impeached. But here, Obama, and Obama, of course, you know, that there, were, there was a challenge to in the Supreme Court, but in no event did, um, did Barack Obama have to suffer the same damage or the same opprobrium around his presidency that, that Bill... He didn't Bill even try to negotiate for a public option. I mean, he didn't even bring it up. Right, exactly, and, and, that's, and that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point, that it was entirely... That, that this he Obamacare is, is stacked... Cover, actually. Yeah, it's stacked so, so lopsidedly in favor of the corporations and, and the health care syndicates that you know, something, you know, this wasn't the case... Um, during the Clinton administration. It gives the insurance so, companies a good footing to last another, you know, more decade. I mean, it, it really, like Dennis Kucinich said, it, it, it just makes it more likely that they'll, you know, keep on running the show. Um, like, they, I mean, here's my thing. I was trying to unite, like, um, like in the big picture, libertarians, progressives, whatever. I, I don't even like these terms so much, but... I, I understand. But, 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 I mean, the thing is, I mean, there is a lot of waste in government, and, and, and we all can acknowledge that. There's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of revolving doors, industries regulating themselves, and no wonder, like, the more money you give them, it's just going to be wasted, and I can totally see that argument, um, and it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's very important to acknowledge it. Um, now, the, the main litmus test, I think, is um, two things. One, I think if we can focus on ways this can totally like um unite those two groups is is make government programs number one voluntary like so if you're an amish person you shouldn't be forced to buy health care or use like health care like maybe you're into alternative health care and, and you want to see chiropractors or you want to you know to take herbs and, and stuff well, like I that. i think i think that's very very important because uh, as things are presently constituted we are 
locked coercively into a system of allopathic care. And you know, people may not want to go the chemotherapy route, right. for example. They, they, may want, they, they may prefer holistic remedies, which have indeed been shown to be more effective. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but, but a doctor, for example, could refuse to put his patient on disability if he or she refuses to accept a um, chemotherapy regimen, for example. So oh, there, yeah. there's, there's a, a, a coercive entrapment into the system of allopathic care. Now, of course, there is a lot of that all over. And, and why is that so? Because of, because of the strangleholds that the research syndicates and the pharmaceutical companies have over our society. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, the pharmaceutical industry, um, a lot of different industries. I mean, like um, even the FDA, like big um, agricultural companies, and uh, and so on. And um, and and there, I bet if you took up, here's another conspiracy theory. I mean, ask how many people believe that they, we already have like about four or five cures to cancer at the least um, that they're just not sharing with us because they want to milk it for all they can. Now, I'm not saying we have any proof on that, but then again, there are people claiming that they do have proof on that and, and doctors have been threatened, just like people have invented like uh, different um, ca kind of cars that, that, you know, supposedly, you know, have been threatened. I don't, I don't know, like, it's, the thing is, I don't have all the facts and it would be nice to get all those facts so we can, it, it is all speculative speculation but what leads to the speculation is the um, lack of transparency so I mean they're just asking for speculation just like John F Kennedy said they're asking for a revolution if they don't let us peacefully um, revolutionize it's not it, it's just will happen it's out of any single individual's control it's just human nature and uh, so I mean it, it's in the long run a lot of the, these um, policies and plans that we're doing now are very short-sighted they're destructive not just to everyone else but also to their own so oh, yeah they're, they're notoriously myopic there's no question but, but the other standard for a government program would be besides being voluntary is that it pays for itself and um, and you could argue that uh, you, you know if it was voluntary um, a lot of people I think would want the public option just voluntarily and they would save a lot on um, being able to buy in bulk which they should be able to do of course which they can't now and, and then also saving on overhead saving on executive salaries um, you know, having public oversight of it by elected officials, um, having it nonprofits, um, you know, and, and and then a lot of transparency and, and openness. Um, and there could be like tiers, uh, you know, on the deductible depending on your income. So it could be progressive. A lot of businesses would save a huge amount of money. Um, I mean, if it, just think about small, mid-size, even large businesses. I mean, I think every business from like, even businesses you might not like, but businesses from like Walmart to Pet Boys to whatever would hugely um, advantage from having a public option and uh, oh, sure yeah it's this militant opposition to uh, public health care or national health care um, doesn't I mean th this opposition by the corporate sector doesn't even seem to make sense on its own terms because it wouldn't, shouldn't. They wouldn't, should be wouldn't it be in their yeah. wouldn't it be in their interest to have a, a public system therefore you know this way they're relieved of any responsibility responsibility to provide health care services to their employees oh yeah yeah it would be a huge cost savings plus they would have healthier employees and, and and you know more people spending less money on medical bills and maybe on you, you know whatever tiki torches at walmart or whatever so um, or just whatever the next big screen tv i mean th th there's a lot of business should really think who they're you, you know supporting i think is another thing but um that's here nor there. So um, what I did want to ask, it, though, is um, it's who are some of your favorite people um, and, uh, and, and why? And, and just Or just interesting people. You might like them or you might think of them as interesting because you don't like them. But either way, uh, what's some people that you know, are in your mind that you know, maybe we all should think about or something? If we and do they have to be living people? <laughs> no, they don't. They okay. don't have to be. Okay, well, I would have to say that my my absolute hero is our greatest moral leader of all, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I, I, I believe his legacy really speaks or should speak for itself because, me, you know, here, here was a man who was taking up um, <clears throat> the cause not just of people of color but of the entire working class, a, a man committed to peace. And I... I, I you know, I, I have long held Dr. King as my 
as my absolute. Well, his dream uh, is the ultimate dream. I mean, it, it, it is like, I mean, eventually, you know, for ever, all those anarchists or whatever out there, I mean, eventually, um, you know, maybe someday, 100 years from now, whatever, 50 years, I don't know, uh, that we could just live by the golden rule where we judge people by their con the content of their character. I mean, if, if we really did that, we would vote the Republicans and Democrats out immediately. And, um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I think he's a great person. Definitely very inspiring, um, and uh, and and definitely kept fighting. You know, till the end. Absolutely, and uh, I would say for the, for the same reasons, even Malcolm X. Um, now, now some have uh, held some disapproval for Malcolm X because of his, uh, for I, I guess for not having the same commitment to nonviolence as Dr. King did. But uh, I think in Malcolm X's case, he was not naive because, you know, the, he, what the violence or or, or the militancy um, that that you know for which he was advocating was really in response to the 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 state you know the state violence being carried out against the working class. Now, granted, Malcolm X was initially a, a, a um, black nationalist, but after his Hajj, that is to say his uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, he realized that, that racism is essentially a function of classism, and uh, that racism is, is an instrumentality. It is used to divide the, the working class against itself, give the white middle class to believe that it has more in common with the oppressor than with other workers. So I, I think for the same reason, he was cognizant of, of racism being a class issue, as was Dr. King, and, and I think you know, at, at different times they met the same fate for the same reasons. That well, and here I think, I, I mean, and maybe the Green Party is the same way, the Libertarian Party, and, and just independents out there, or whoever you are, it, it's just, um, I mean, that's the beautiful thing of just not in a sense that we're a collective of individuals. I mean, if, if you judge someone like that, then you're just, again, the same thing with the empire. Like, if we treat other countries that way, it's going to come back to us. It's just natural. It's almost physics. It's not so much of a uh, proverb or anything as it is just uh, natural law. Um, it, or it's, That's the way it seems to have been happening for some reason. And, um, and if we judge others as a group um, and as not, like, what better human rights could someone have than the full set of individual rights um and 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 so but but just more on a less legalistic way um i mean by seeing someone as an individual giving them a chance uh to be themselves and, and not exactly what someone might have assumed um is really giving yourself a chance of uh you know, being judged that way yourself, but also, um, you know, seeing someone that might be been more than, than meets the eye, you, you know, and uh, um, so. Sure, it's as though the, the established order has written a script for the entire working class, and our public schools, they're, they're, their job under the present system is to train and condition obedient and compliant workers. I mean, you, you have that you, you have that despicable No Child Left Behind Act, which you know which has which has shifted the uh, focus of education from actually educating to mere test preparation. And there, I mean, granted that some of the some of the legislation, to my knowledge, has been withered away somewhat. I mean, I, I would personally advocate advocate a, a complete reveal, uh, repeal rather, of um, NCLB. But as a general matter, our educational system is um, it, well, it's not focused is, on education, where yeah. where people's um, creativity and individuality can be tapped. Instead, it, it's just shaping workers to go out and. Oh, you're Totally, totally. Like, just to be a, a, a drone worker be, like, just to be a drone. Like, yeah. just like the drones we have that are just operated by someone else, um, you, you, you know, remote controlled. And, um, yeah, and, and just, you know, not think for yourself. I mean, I, I think, though, I mean, fundamentally, I mean, learning is a lifelong process. People have got to have that you know, drive to want to do that. A lot of things could change. Like, I mean, I bet the space program inspired a lot of people. Like, you know, when there was a new world that probably inspired, you know, Christopher Columbus's and, and people like that. And so there's a lot of things that can go into that. I mean, I think, you know, when I look, I mean, if you go on to um, 
the internet you can search different like uh, schools that are um, experimenting with different things I've seen schools like I think it was in Oregon or Washington where they take the kids outside all day and or here's another type of class where they were teaching kids like um, to really set the own agenda for the class itself right. I mean, now of course why can't schools such as these be be the norm and not the exception and there's so many different kinds yeah. you, you know I mean and, and and so I mean yeah the, the, there should be tons of different you, sure. you know things like that and but the main thing is pe people should be able to get that knowledge and right. uh, and be able to pursue that happiness and, and you, uh, you mentioned the space for you mentioned the space program I realize you were using that just to illustrate a larger point but let's take that for example look at how the space program has been sacrificed on behalf of militarism that what what could have gone into space exploration i mean uh, and of course you know the the jobs that could have uh, been created oh, yeah why not pay boeing instead of making yeah. you know um bombers that and, we don't need yeah like, like let's start like you know exploring the um solar system exactly exactly but of course this has all been sacrificed on behalf of more militarism more war and and, and so on yeah, it sure has, um, and and actually, it might make our perspectives a lot different. There might be a lot more peace. We might, you know, realize the lots that we're fighting over don't don't mean anything. And uh, as much, it's kind of like you know, people say when they go to the Grand Canyon that you know they see how little they really are. And uh, so, yeah, it could have a psychological yeah, effect sure. as as well. And um, you know, uh, it, it, so yeah, <laughs> especially in places like um, you, you know Israel and Palestine right now. I mean, maybe um, you know have some joint space adventures uh, with, with them in in, in in the name of uh, peace. And uh, um, I mean, after I, George Carlin once said, I mean, he didn't ever understood how people could be proudful of of you know so much their heritage as because they really had they they didn't earn and deserve it. But a lot of people now want to you know, um, put their pride on, on stuff that other people accomplished and, and like as if they did it themselves. Right, I remember that mon that monologue in which he decried uh, um, ethnocentricity and exceptionalism. And uh, I, I remember one of the things he asked rhetorically was, well, what does it mean to be proud to be Irish as, as he was? And you know, in other words, pride in having a in a predisposition to colon cancer, if if I'm if I'm remembering the monologue yeah, <laughs> correctly, like that. yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's I mean, and and life's you know, short. we're we're here on this spaceship Earth. I mean, you, you know, what are we? You know, if you want to, do, you you don't have to like anybody that you don't want to do, and you don't have to hang out with anyone you don't want to hang out with. You know, and um, so it, it's um, but you know, just throwing some thoughts out there. And uh, so anything else I forgot to to mention, uh, Joseph and. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, before we get in this interview here. No, I, th I I believe we've covered everything that I had anticipated that we would cover. Um, again, it's uh, am I allowed to plug my website over the show? Oh, yeah, please do. Um, yeah, we we will end up we would end up doing that. And, and yeah, it's it's d i a f e r i a f o r congress dot info. But please, you go ahead and and say yeah, with your own Yeah, for congress dot info and. Uh, uh, for your audience, if uh, if anyone wants to fire off an email to me, it's it's diaferia for congress at gmail dot com. Diaferia, I'll spell that for you. It's D as in David, I A, F as in Frank, E R I A, followed by for Congress in both the website and the email address. In the case of the email address, it's diaferia for congress at gmail dot com. Website again, diaferia for congress dot info. Excellent. And um, so everyone who's part of the Occupy or part of the t Paul party or, or Ron Paul or just anyone who, you know, thinks that maybe, um, you, you know, it, it's worth taking a risk for a third party candidate this year while Congress has a 10 percent approval rating. I mean, this isn't um, like uh, th this is a return to normal. I mean, this is electing regular people who are going to take their oath to the Constitution who made it on the ballot. I mean, what a spot that you get to be on here, Joseph. I mean, if people do wake up this year, I mean, you're right there ready to, uh, y you know, go into um, the, the arena, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Congress. And, yes, if, uh, I, if I can just make one more point about the idea of voting for a third-party candidate, because it has often been said or it's been suggested that casting a vote for a third-party candidate, and in some, some cases third parties are contemptuously referred to as minor party candidates, but, but in any case, in any case, it, it, very often one hears, well, it, it's a wasted vote. 
to that, I would simply say that no vote that is cast out of conscience, no reason and informed vote is ever, ever wasted. Yeah, we're not like, um, you know, we're we're making we're taking action here i mean we're trying to put in who we want instead of trying to guess who's going to be the winner or or i I mean i'm just saying at the congressional level i mean i'm not even talking about presidential politics no no, i realize that i realize that if there's any place to take a chance or a risk i mean let's let's do i mean do it at the congressional level and 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 really um i I mean it's not even such a big risk i mean you know the, the 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 dinocrats they they're eventually going to start to fade out. Let's get that process along here. Did you say, did you say the dinocrats? Yes, the <laughs> dinocrats um, and and the redundlicans yeah. were just um, they they're they're done with their dying breed. I mean, it's just time for some. New, we need to yeah, like liven yeah. it up, get some you know fresh blood in there. Yes, and there are there are some there are other very fine candidates running on the Green Party ticket. My uh, my friend Carl Lundgren, who's running for state senate here in new york and then in an in an adjacent congressional district there's uh, tony gronovich and we ex- have interviewed him actually. oh that that's right i believe you did tell me that but you know these are excellent candidates trevor archer um dan zuger uh don hasek running upstate uh the green party's pretty strong in in, in new york just kind of like you know the libertarian party's pretty strong yeah, in like yeah. texas and and like so it's like um, yeah, to my understanding there have never been you know, this many greens running simultaneously oh and there's never been this low record uh, approval rating for congress it's a record low since we've right. been taking statistics yeah, and and, right, mean, and rightly so if rightly. there's ever been a, i mean there is an opportunity this year like more than there have been in the past there have been fusion candidates in vermont there's a green party candidate who's endorsed by the libertarian party of not vermont but it's delaware actually and um, uh-huh. andrew groff um, so that could happen here i'm just saying we have another month and, and a half um let's really you, you know get excited you, you know see what the possibilities are envision you know um uh, you, you know um taking our country back and, and setting it better making it um y- you know get rid of anything that you think is uh, cool or cool or uncool i mean remember the republicans they don't want you to vote i mean that's that's in the democrats that's that's the best thing that could happen for them is a low turnout right and uh that's what they're hoping for and um and they're not expecting that um you know you're going to be so bold to uh select um something else and i'm saying if we get 50 Plus, I mean, that yeah. would be a good I mean, start. I mean, I even saw that at the local level. And may, maybe I should also disclose, I, I should disclose for your audience that I, I am a former Democrat, having run as a Democrat 25 years ago. And now even in my uh, experiences in mainstream politics, I mean, that, that has always been the case, that the, that the major parties, as a general matter, but the, but the Republicans specifically, you know, that they've always favored or at least hoped for low turnout. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because then they're just their base will turn out. And um, so instead of voting no, vote no uh, to the Republicans and the Democrats. Yes, right. Uh, and, uh, and again, a, uh, um, I, I understand the purpose behind tactical voting, but again, I would, I would want to emphasize for your audience that, that no vote of conscience, that, that no that no informed vote should ever be thought of as a wasted vote. Yeah, that's not really, that, that isn't really acting fully informed. I mean, um, like uh, 20 years of lesser to evils might as well equal like one really bad equal uh, evil. So, I, I mean, it, it's it's got to the point where th- there cannot be any more, they're, they're not even like um, lesser evils. They are completely evil. I mean, they vote for the NDAA, they, they vote for, um, doing stuff that you definitely wouldn't want done to you um, as a human uh, like uh, on on this planet and um, and something you definitely wouldn't want your kids to grow up in I don't think or future right. generations and um, so uh, Joseph I will say goodbye to you um, after this interview real quick but thank you so much for okay, uh, thank you very much Tom sir, and, and giving us these um, uh, you know answers to these questions thanks sir it's my pleasure